Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the ever-changing world of technology? Tech It Out can help make some sense of it all. Breaking down geek speak into street speak, technology columnist, author, and TV personality Mark Saltzman covers consumer technology each week for every listener. Mark tackles the latest news, reviews, and how-tos to help you understand what's hot, what's not, and why. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Tech It Out, episode 130. Thank you for tuning into the program. Hoping you're having a great weekend so far. We have a great show planned for you this hour. And welcome, by the way, to the two new stations joining us across the U.S. Last weekend, we picked up KDIZ AM, that's Freedom 1570, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul market. And this weekend, we're now on KSCB in the liberal Kansas market. So welcome to those new listeners. And thank you to everyone else for tuning in. This program, Tech It Out, now airs 97 times across the country. And you may be also listening as a podcast. So however you're tuning in, thank you. And I hope you're enjoying the program. All right, I hope you're ready to geek out this hour. We're going to have some fun. In a moment from now, we're going to learn about a retro video game arcade cabinet that you can buy for the home that does more than just let you play classics from yesteryear. It's called Legends Ultimate from a company called At Games. We're also going to talk about Apple and what 2020 could look like for them when we touch base with a veteran analyst named Tim Baharin. We're also going to discuss the rollout of electric vehicle charging stations and what the near future looks like for EVs, electric vehicles, when we catch up with a company called Flow. All of this and more on this weekend's Tech It Out, powered by Asus. For those in search of incredible, I'll tell you more about Asus shortly. They, of course, make some stellar laptops and desktops, accessories, uh, things like smartwatches, smartphones, tablets, video game gear, and a lot more. So I'll tell you more about them. But let's kick off our first interview and get our game on. Retro gamers, listen up. If you long for the days of simple 2D games like Pac-Man or Galaga and have always dreamed of owning an arcade cabinet in your home that won't break the bank, we're going to learn now about Legends Ultimate from a company called At Games. In fact, this new upright cabinet can do much more than just play classic games from the arcades or older consoles, as you'll soon hear with our guest, Jonathan Siemens. He's the Director of Marketing and Communications at Chizcom. That's the agency that's working with At Games. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for having me, Mark. I'm, I'm excited to talk about the, the Legends Ultimate. And for full transparency, you were kind enough to lend me a cabinet to play around with over the past month, and I'm loving it. So I just want to make sure my uh, listeners knew about that. But before we talk about Legends Ultimate, tell us about the company At Games. What have they worked on in the past? So At Games has been around since 2001, and they're uh, a leader in innovative, consumer-oriented, interactive entertainment products. And, and I know that's a mouthful, but what you may know them best for is their their line of hdmi hdmi blast dongles and their their flashback consoles so there's sort of the the legends flashback which is a sort of a sega genesis looking unit and then there's the atari uh flashback which we released this year which has that that great wood grain paneling and then there's those hdmi blast dongles that you just plug and play into your tv and and feature a handful of retro classics Got it. All right. So they look like a little game controller, but they've got games built inside. And then you can play those classics on your TV. And they're usually limited to, like, what, up to 10 games or something, right? Yeah, it's 10 to 12 games for those little dongles. For instance, there's a Bandai Namco one. We have one uh, called the Adventure Blast that features some great Disney titles. And they're they're just really fun and easy to use. And they're, they're really transportable, which is always nice. Okay, so that's portable, so you can bring it to a hotel room, you can bring it to a relative's house, plug it into the TV and play away. But now let's talk about Legends Ultimate, which is a non-portable, full-sized arcade cabinet for lovers of classic arcade games. Why is this particular cabinet a big deal? Tell us about Legends Ultimate. Legends Ultimate's a big deal because this is this is the future of arcade gaming. This is the first connected arcade. This is 350 built-in games, no quarters needed. So the Legends Ultimate, like I said, is it's 350 built-in games and much more it features wi-fi bluetooth ethernet connectivity plus we have a weekly firmware update that only enhances the functionality and the possibilities of the arcade um so the legends ultimate that you got in november and i mean as a legends ultimate owner yourself you've probably seen this is very different than the arcade now you can pair a um amazon fire stick now via bluetooth to the arcade and 
we have to kind of give a shout out to our community just for coming at us with some of these suggestions and us and our, our dev team for putting them together. <laughs> All right. And Dev, of course, development team that is continuously working on new features. But let's just break it down again, Jonathan. So this is called Legends Ultimate. It looks like a traditional arcade cabinet that you would uh, see in an arcade. And we'll get to the controls in a moment because there's everything there. You know, the kitchen sink to play all different kinds of games. But at its core, you can play 350 built-in games. But unlike the 80s and early 90s, you can now pause games, right? Like you're a kid and your mom is calling you for dinner. You can press pause and then come back to that game of Tron if you want, correct? Yeah, you can You can pause, you can rewind. And right now the functionality is not available on all the games. But we're hoping in the upcoming months with all the firmware updates, we're, we're able to get all 350 built in games with the the pause and rewind functionality my son ethan was playing burger time which was one of my favorites back in the 80s and i didn't even realize that you could rewind so he pressed the button when he died and it went back in time and he was able to redo that level without dying like oh that's sneaky but uh yeah so i was pretty impressed with that so it's 350 built-in games but you can add more games as well and i'm not talking about the amazon fire stick support or anything but can you talk to us a bit about adding more games and some of the other things you can do with this for sure. So the, the the number one easiest way is through APL, which is Arcade Played Link. Uh, so I know I talked about those existing Blast and Flashback consoles before, but you can actually plug the USB or HDMI right into the, the arcade, which has two USB ports and two HDMI ports, and play the games right on that arcade. So if you have a, the Bandai Namco or the Adventure Blast, there's 10 to 12 games easily added to the arcade. Another way is through ArcadeNet. And while this is currently in beta, we're constantly adding new games to the collection and you're you're able to play them using the, the power of the, the connected arcade. And our goal is to just keep rolling out new titles that are supported on the arcade. The, the third option is BYOG. So here's one of my favorite features is that you're actually able to play your favorite games from publishers like Steam, Epic, Origin, Blizzard, or even stream locally from your, your own PC on your network. Yeah, so it is not just a retro gaming machine that lets you play games from 20 or 30 years ago. But what you're saying then, Jonathan, is that you can also play new games when it's connected to those uh, computer gaming streaming services like Steam and Epic and even wirelessly communicating with your PC. That's that's what you're essentially saying, correct? That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, you can play Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, the, the, even Fortnite if you really wanted. Okay, and it has a built-in 24-inch screen in this arcade cabinet, and it stands at 66 inches tall. So again, it is just like the kind of machine you would see in an arcade. Exactly. Cool. We're chatting with Jonathan Siemens from Chizcom. That's the agency that's working with At Games and their new Legends Ultimate arcade cabinet that has uh, 350 built-in games, and you can add more, whether they be older retro games or newer games as well, if you use any of those services. Talk to us a bit about the controls. So as I hinted at earlier, there's joysticks, buttons, trackballs, and more, right? Exactly. So there's there's two sets of arcade quality joysticks, six buttons each, uh, two sets of spinners, which are my personal favorite. They're they're this rose gold color and really nicely machined, and then you get one trackball. Plus, I, I know I mentioned those USB ports. So for multiplayer, you're actually able to play with an Xbox One or PS4 controllers. Oh. That's cool. In, in, in a wired fashion, not Bluetooth or anything, right? Correct. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, but uh, so for those retro gamers listening, of course, a trackball could be used for things like missile command or centipede dials, or as you call them, spinners could be used in a game like Tempest, where you can go left and right or, or in Tron. And then, of course, buttons are used for most games. And here's a little fun fact. Two of the most popular arcade games from the 80s don't require any buttons at all. And that would be Pac-Man and Frogger. Aha. All right. Now, I understand there's also a global leaderboard for some of the games. So you can compete for high scores against others. Yeah, there is. So right now there are global leaderboards for Burger Time, which I know you mentioned is one of your favorites. Yep. Uh, Tetris and Fix It Felix Jr. with with more coming. And I, I'm going to let your audience in on a little 
kind of sneak preview uh, for those who want to sort of compete against others online. Uh, stay tuned for February because there, there might be something special coming. Okay. And with that in mind, how much does Legends Ultimate cost and where can our listeners learn more about this cabinet? Uh, the Legends Ultimate costs five ninety nine, and you can visit at games.net slash arcades to learn more. And don't forget to follow us on our social channels at, at Games Gaming. Okay, at Games Gaming on social and then at games.net slash arcades. And by the way, if for, for those who have looked into pricing on some of these other cabinets out there that have retro games, they can be into the thousands of dollars for this kind of size and quality, not to mention all the extra things that Legends Ultimate can do. It's awesome bit of gear. We didn't even get to the fact that you can add your own games as well on a USB. So there's a lot more to it. It's a very versatile device. So check it out for yourself. Jonathan Siemens, thank you very much for your time. Game on, brother. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. All right. You're listening to Tech It Out. When we return on this program, we're going to catch up with analyst Tim Beharin from Creative Strategies. We're going to chat all things Apple. How does this huge company look in 2020? Tech It Out is powered by Asus, the company that creates technology for today and tomorrow's smart life, including its line of award-winning laptops, desktops, monitors, smartphones, tablets, smartwatches, and much more. For those in search of incredible, visit asus.com slash us slash radio for more info. That's A-S-U-S dot com. Asus. We'll be right back with more Tech It Out. Listen to Tech It Out whenever you want. Find the Check It Out podcast at iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Tech It Out. As you may or may not know, Apple became the first trillion dollar company about 18 months ago, measured by market cap, by the way. Then they dipped a bit, hit that threshold again last fall. But hey, milestone aside, no doubt we're talking about one of, if not the hottest tech companies on the planet. But will that momentum continue? Will Apple remain as hot in 2020 as they have in years past? Or have they jumped the shark to use a probably outdated Fonzie and Happy Days reference for being on the downswing of success. We're joined on the line by Tim Beharin. He's a seasoned technology analyst with Creative Strategies, as well as a columnist for several prominent publications. Welcome to the show, Tim. Glad to be with you. All right. Now, since this is the first time you've been on the program, please tell us a bit about your work as an analyst and a columnist in the tech space. Sure. I've been a technology analyst since 1981. And when I joined Creative Strategies and actually was one of the first PC technology analysts in the market. So I've been covering this business for a long time. In the process, because Apple's in my backyard, I concentrated a great deal on Apple and doing analysis of them over the years. I have written, you know, I don't know, hundreds, I guess, of bits of news and information and analysis over over that 30, 38 years about Apple. Amazing. So with that in mind, how did they do in 2019 overall when it comes to sales or revenue? I'll let you choose how you want to measure their success. And how do they look in 2020? Well, the revenue side actually was pretty good. They had a bit, a bit of a blip in revenue at the beginning of the first quarter of this year because the transition uh, from a year ago, September, with the original 10 pluses or whatever that were introduced then, uh, didn't take off quite the way they expected so that the projection of how many they sold in that Christmas quarter was was a little lower than the street would have liked. Mm -hmm. uh, that has changed dramatically over this last year. And their numbers have continued to grow, but more specifically, not just good sales with the iPhone, which has been steady. And in this last quarter, we think it's going to be a record, but their services business has been phenomenal. You put in context what Apple is doing with services alone, it's a $10 billion per quarter segment of their business now, wow. of revenue. So by the end of this year, they'll be... It, the, the services business alone will be a $50 billion industry. Wow. I will ask you about Apple TV Plus specifically in a couple of moments. But when you talk services, clearly you're talking about video streaming like that, music streaming with Apple Music, maybe even Apple Arcade, which is a, a monthly uh, subscription service for uh, games to play on demand. And, and Apple News. And Apple News. That's another good one, of course. So we're not just talking hardware like uh, Macs and, and iPads and iPhones and AirPods, but we're talking software and services as well. And that's recurring revenue, right? When somebody uh, subscribes to 
of these services. It's an ongoing uh, income for, for Apple. So that's always a good thing. But going back to hardware for a moment, rumor has it that Apple will be releasing several phones in 2020, which would be a first for them aside from, you know, usually they have maybe two phones or something. So is that a good move if those rumors are, are correct that they're going to have a, a variety of devices hit the market this year? Yeah. And what we suspect is, first of all, the premium product will be the first their first 5G phone. Right. And there is tremendous pent up for for pent up interest for 5G phone, uh, not only here, but in China and in Europe and other areas where 5G has already got a little bit of a stronghold. U.S., as you know, won't be fully built out with 5G until 2022, 2023. But you've got pockets of fairly good 5G. In fact, here in the Valley, we have 5G now. Mm -hmm. Uh, the lower level 5G, but, you know, we're still getting uh, significant upgrade in speeds. But if if you are one who travels a great deal, especially, you really want to tap into the next generation of wireless, which is 5G. The other phones, there are other phones that will probably come out that continue just to support 4G, uh, but they will have higher speed processors, better screens, etc. But Yes, I think they have to have a range of phones this time coming out because not everybody's going to want a 5G, but of those who do will drive huge demand for it. And then on the low end of the spectrum, it's no secret that Apple prides themselves in being a premium brand. But some analysts say the reason why Samsung and depending on the market, Huawei bests Apple in market uh, share is because there are many pockets of the world that can't afford these $1,000 plus devices they, they, that Apple is not catering to. To the entry level market, but if they reintroduce the iPhone SE, dubbed the SE2, then that could also put them in a competitive space there, correct? Uh, it could, but let's be clear they Apple never is at the low end of the market. Remember, I can go to India and some other places and I can buy smartphones for $99 or mm-hmm, $120. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They'll never be into that that level what you're talking about even if the se is probably going to be five six hundred dollars okay but yes there's a there's still a significant amount of people who that price range is attractive because they want an apple product right it's a brand thing and then speaking of other markets like China, Apple was hot for a couple of years and they've been very cold for the last couple of years. I don't know if that's tied to the U.S.-China trade wars or the Huawei shun, but it seems that Apple is getting hot again, from what I understand, and iPhones are starting to sell again. Do you think that will continue this year? Yeah, it will. Um, Tim Cook has actually done a marvelous job in dealing with the, the, the uh, uh, tariff issue by keeping uh, the Trump administration and others from placing them under some of those restrictive tariffs. Um, That has helped them gain a little bit more ground. But these new phones that Apple, I think, will bring out later this year especially will help their position in China. But let's be clear, it's even growing in China now. They've had some record numbers even in the last quarter. And when they do the uh, earnings report, it'll be really interesting to see what took place in China over this last holiday quarter. We'll continue chatting with Tim Beharin from Creative Strategies when we return on Tech It Out. We'll be right back. Want to follow Mark? Google him. Mark with a C and Saltzman with a Z. Breaking down geek speak into street speak. This is Tech It Out. Tech It Out with technology columnist, author, and TV personality, Mark Saltzman. Welcome back to Tech It Out. We're chatting with Tim Beharin. He is a seasoned technology analyst with Creative Strategies. Uh, what publications do you write for again, Tim? Is it Fortune? Well, I've written for a lot of publications, including for many years for Time and Fortune. I'm right now spending more time with Fast Company and Forbes. Right. That's it. It was Forbes I was thinking of. That, that's terrific. Yeah, I read something right. you wrote uh, the other week. I thought it was great. Let's uh, continue the thread of hardware for a bit, and then we'll, we'll shift over to services. AirPods did, I think, surprisingly well for Apple last year to the tune of about $6 billion in revenue right. from some estimates. Do you expect that momentum to continue? I do, especially the newer headset, which is around 250 bucks. That The fact that they were able to put noise canceling into that AirPod was a game changer for them. The other AirPods were actually good, but this is really, really good. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I used it, used it on a, a flight to China recently and was so surprised 
how good the, the noise cancellation work. But I expect that to continue to grow. I also like that they're a little bit shorter. The, that that stick, that white stick coming out of the yeah. air is a little bit shorter because I, I I was always a little fussy on the design part. But I like how the the new ones look much better. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, more, they're more ergonomically streamlined. I just read last week that the in Europe that the EU may mandate that all mobile phone companies have to use the same charging cable. Apple has pushed back on that because they're the only ones with their proprietary Lightning cable. Where do you think that will net out? Well, first of all. Apple will fight that because of the way Lightning is designed to have so many different types of functions because of the the, the way it handles input and output. <laughs> Excuse me. But if the if let's say the EU tries to force that kind of standardization, Apple will find a workaround. It'll either be around a, a adopt a type of an adapter or something. But I don't believe Apple is going to give up the Lightning uh, connection anytime Mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they said that it would stifle innovation if they bowed to that kind of pressure and that there's already a billion devices out there that have a Lightning cable. And that would just be a a real big hit on those uh, customers. Ironically, the EU is trying to protect consumers by saying that it's it's easier to have one universal. uh, You know, I'm sort of on the fence uh, on that, by the way. (laughs) I like my USB-C and I wish that was a standard. It's becoming one in their Macs. But let's see if it uh, makes it to mobile. Perhaps not. But let's end off on services, Tim. Okay, so Apple. Apple TV Plus, it launched in November, if I'm not mistaken. They've already had some critical success, at least, with programs like The Morning Show. It was nominated for several awards. Are people buying into this service? It seems like there's more hype about Disney Plus, which also launched around the same time, over Apple TV Plus. Or is that not fair? Well, but let's be clear. They're two different, very distinct services. Disney, as you know, has a family brand. And Apple has done really good in the context of keeping, you know, pornography and any other type of stuff off their system so that they are considered also more family friendly. But if you looked at any of the, some of the shows that they have now, I mean, they're mostly R rated or a lot of them are, at least are R rated mm-hmm. and edgy at the least. And, you know, I do believe that while Disney obviously could have some significant numbers, you got to be careful because, number one, Apple's in this for the long term. They're willing to put significant money. In fact, we believe that they'll put $13 billion into just programming for the Apple, uh, uh, Apple TV Plus this year. Hmm. So they're not going to, you know, to play games with this. They're in it to win, and they're going to pick up, I think, significant speed over time. And also – if you buy a new Mac or iPad or something, you, you know, you get it for free for a year. And once you get used to it and start getting hooked into some of their programs, you know, you're going to actually, I think, turn over that to a subscription when that year's out. Yeah, it's a it's a very smart move on Apple's part because they've got the hardware base. So you might as well right. bundle the service and give everybody a, a free taste of it for an extended period of time. Okay, awesome. Tim, thank you very much for your time. As we wrap up, where can we learn more about your work? Uh, I know you mentioned you're with Forbes and Fast Company, but uh, is there also a creative strategies site that you'd recommend? Yeah, well, well, actually, our own personal blog is techpinions.com. And my son and I and Carolina, Carolina from Creative Strategy and Bob O'Donnell from Technalysis and one of the gentlemen from IDC who's a good friend, the five of us do that site as well. Techpinions.com. Love it. Correct. Tim Beharin, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, I haven't had Tim on this program before, even though I've interviewed him several times for publications like USA Today. So I hope you enjoyed that insight into one of the biggest tech companies on the planet, one of the biggest companies on the planet, and his perspective on where they may be going. Maybe you're an investor, and that kind of information is useful to you. But uh, Tim's usually right about all this stuff. I follow him quite closely, so it was great to have him on the program for the first time. But he's not a one-trick pony, so we'll probably have him back to talk about other companies and get some dirt on them. Good stuff. You're listening to Tech It Out on the Radio American Network. This is a weekly program that looks at tech, but in plain English. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of a deep dive, you know, inside baseball kind of thing. In fact, you may know that my tagline is that I try to break down geek speak into street speak to demystify technology as much as I aim to celebrate it. Speaking of Apple and speaking of my 
approach to making sense of tech. I wrote the book, shameless plug here, but I did write the book Apple Watch for Dummies, which is uh, doing well, thankfully, and around the world too. It's translated to several languages and distributed across the planet. So that's pretty cool. And if you like my take on tech and how I tried to uh, make some sense of it, if you are on social media, I'd encourage you to follow me on Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn. For example, I write a tech tip of the day a daily little bit of uh, advice on how to master your technology in a language you can understand. I'm on Twitter at Mark underscore Saltzman. That's Mark with a C underscore S-A-L-T-Z-M-A-N. Tech It Out is powered by Asus. They create technology for today and tomorrow's smart life, including its line of award-winning laptops, desktops, monitors, smartphones, tablets, smartwatches, and more. For those in search of incredible, visit asus.com slash us slash radio for more info. That's asus.com forward slash us forward slash radio. When we return on Tech It Out, we're going to talk about the automotive industry. And as you know, technology is changing that space as well. We're going to talk with a company called Flow, that's F-L-O, about their electric vehicle charging stations rolling out across the country. They've done a a big job in LA, but they are in other markets as well, uh, also across Canada. And uh, we're going to hear what's different from them uh, opposed to other EV charging stations and how they're looking to really change the game for those who do own an EV or for those who are thinking about picking up an electric vehicle. So stay tuned to Tech It Out. We'll be right back with Flo on the Radio America Network. Breaking down geek speak into street speak. Tech It Out, hosted by Mark Saltzman. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Tech It Out. If you saw any of the vehicles unveiled at the recent LA Auto Show or even the Consumer Electronics Show, you'll no doubt notice that vehicles coming down the road are in fact EVs or electric vehicles. And there are some innovations in related businesses too, like EV charging stations, as you'll now hear with our guest, Travis Allen. He's from Flow, that's F-L-O. Travis, by the way, is VP of Public Affairs, General Counsel, and member of the executive team as well. Welcome to the show, Travis. Well, thank you for having me, Mark. It's great to be here. Sure. Now, before we talk about flow, how are EVs doing today? Kind of high level. Are, are they in fact selling? Because if you look at the cars that are being unveiled for the future, most of them are EVs. But what about today? Yeah, it's a very interesting time right now for electric vehicles. And certainly if, if you were looking around CES, you saw some pretty exciting uh, electric and autonomous uh, concept models there. But even in, in the real world, we're starting to see many more electric vehicles on the road and in people's garages. Um, so what, what what's interesting is there's a bunch of folks who you know, their, their full-time job is basically predicting auto trends or uh, the percentage of electric vehicles that will be sold compared to traditional internal combustion engine vehicles. Year after year, those those guys have to um, basically redo their forecasts because they're consistently seeing higher than expected uh, sales. So it's a very, very interesting time to be in and around the EV space. Um, and many people are now predicting that somewhere between 2022 and 2024, um, electric vehicles are basically going to hit what they call price parity, meaning that it costs the same as a typical internal combustion engine. Uh, and, and it's expected that that would even be a, a, an even higher driver because EVs are already cheaper to operate and have a lot of performance benefits. Um, But at that point, they may also be cheaper to buy. And so we're expecting that, you know, we may go from three to seven percent of sales, depending on the state you're in, in in the United States, up to 30 or even 40 percent sales uh, somewhere in the middle of, of this decade. So it, it's it's an exciting uh, an exciting time. And it's a win-win, right? So you're buying a car that uh, isn't breaking the bank. Even Teslas have more affordable models to choose from. You've got amazing performance and other bells and whistles, extended range, which you're not getting that range anxiety much anymore. You have a quiet ride and it's better for the environment. Never putting gas in your car again as well. So, I mean, there's really a, a lot of advantages to EV. So I, I'm excited about the, the pickup on 
on those. So talk to us about the work Flow is doing in the U.S., starting with L.A. We're talking about charging stations here. Yeah, so we launched in the United States actually last year, and some of our deployments are they're spread out across the U.S., but uh, we have had some pretty exciting results in Southern California, particularly in Los Angeles, where we with the Bureau of Street Lighting um, to start installing what are called level two charging stations on uh, street lamps in, in Los Angeles. And there's a couple interesting things about that particular project. So uh, the first one is that they're being installed on street lamps because the city of LA made a pretty um, bold decision to replace traditional uh, street lighting with LEDs, which have a lower electricity draw. And so by making that investment, they kind of save money, first of all, because they're cheaper to power, but then they also had some extra electrical capacity. And so they asked us if we could put together a kind of a modified station for Los Angeles so that they could use those for, for EV charging purposes, um, meaning that you you end up kind of getting a two for one. You've got the street light, but then you also have the uh, you know, useful piece of uh, charging infrastructure right there where people happen to be parking. Interesting. So I watched one of the videos online and it looked like they were sort of curbside. So do you pull over in a spot or are you still on the road in order to take advantage of uh, these um, charging stations? Yeah. So it depends where you deploy them, but typically a curbside station is used where you would have people doing a street parking anyway. So the whole idea is to meet people. Yeah. Where they're parking. Okay. So, cause I like the convenience of that, you know, you've got maybe a charging station at home and I know some people don't even have one at home. They have one at the office, which is great. Cause that's where they spend, you know, a good eight hours or more of their day. So, but in this case, this is like those charging stations that already exist, but these are just designed to be more convenient. Does it not deliver as fast of a charge compared to those like let's what did you call it, tier two kind of charging stations compared to tier one that's a great question and this is such there's so much industry jargon unfortunately um although i have to say once you start driving an ev it, it becomes a lot clearer uh so these stations you're right are level one stations and that means that they use 40 volts and there that's pretty much your normal charging station so that's the kind of uh the kind of power that you would use at home it's the kind of power you'd likely use at work how long you need to spend at it really depends on first of all how depleted your battery is uh, and second of all um, how big your battery is so the way that we see so we run one of the largest networks in in north america and what we see is that people tend to approach EV charging kind of the way that they approach cell phone charging. So if you think about how you probably charge your cell phone, you might plug it in at night. You might also plug it in at your desk um, just to keep your, your battery relatively full. And, and that's likely what people will be doing with a lot of these stations. So maybe they're going in to visit a local store or a restaurant and they happen to have a flow station nearby. So they're probably going to go and just, just top up their battery a bit. It's not that it's fully depleted. All right. We just need to hit pause for a moment, but we'll continue chatting with flow when we return. Follow Mark Saltzman on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Listen to check it out whenever you want. We're chatting with Travis Allen. He's from Flow, a VP of Public Affairs and General Counsel for the company that is now starting to deploy EV charging stations across the U.S. Before the break, I was asking if the Flow EV charging stations were as powerful as some of the other ones out there. That is, do you have to wait longer to charge them up? And you were explaining that, no, it is the typical sort of speed that you would expect and, and the amount of power that you may have in something at home or something in the office. You were saying that it's it's probably not going to be fully depleted since these are curbside. So you already have some juice in the battery, if you will, and you just need a bit of a top up. Uh, that's that's I believe what you were saying before the break. Yeah, in that case, they may they may only need like a fifteen or twenty minute charge. Some people uh, were starting to find, particularly in Montreal, which has a very advanced network of these, people will actually use it as a substitute uh, if they live in an apartment or a condominium and they can't actually charge at home. We're finding that people are 
increasingly starting to use these at night to be a sort of a substitute for home charging. So it, it sort of depends. Yeah. Okay. So depending on the size of the battery, depending on uh, how depleted it is, it could take a few minutes to much longer. So you want to sort of plan around that. I, I get that. Does it work with all EVs? I mean, a dumb question, but like from the Nissan Leaf all the way up to a high-end Tesla? Yeah, not a dumb question at all. So our stations are designed to work with all major models of electric vehicles on the road today. Not all networks are are open like that. So um, we we have what we would call like a public network, which means it's it's for everybody that drives an EV. And a level two station can be used uh, from the cars with the really big batteries all the way down to what what are called plug-in hybrids, which are the ones that have a combination of gas and battery works on all got it a hybrid yeah and how much does it cost on average to uh charge up your battery right so that again depends on the station you're using and the state of charge um the ones in los angeles that we were talking about a moment ago those are two dollars an hour uh to charge so it's it's a really low cost and you know if you were fairly depleted with a typical ev you might you might charge for three to four hours, um, but but oftentimes we find people are only using them for one or two hours. So you know you're talking two to four dollars, pretty pretty inexpensive. And if it doubles as a parking spot, that charge is separate. You're paying for parking regardless. Yeah, depending on depending on where it's deployed. Yeah. So it's not like it's one price to park and charge up. No, although there are cities where where that happens. Oh, cool. And what are your expansion plans like? I mean, uh, again, I, I, I focused a lot of my research on your work in uh, the Los Angeles area, but uh, how are you uh, looking at uh, 2020 across the country? Yes, yeah, so 2020 is going to be a big year for, I think, everybody in our industry. There's going to be a lot of uh, increased public charging that's going to happen because of the, the basically large increase in uh, electric vehicle sales, particularly driven by Tesla um, and their Model 3, but also by a number of the big traditional global automakers that are now starting to bring their EVs to market. Right. So we'll be focusing a lot on, on both coasts of the United States. We have Really exciting projects to announce, also curbside and uh, uh, in in New York City and, and in other places across the U.S. So you're going to start seeing more flow logos around, particularly if you drive EVs. Um, and I think in general, the increased consumer interest in EVs is going to lead to a lot more public infrastructure because policymakers know that mm-hmm. investing in you know good quality, reliable stations is a to help people who might be concerned about range, uh, it tends to be uh, associated with higher EV adoption once right. the stations are in. So yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot coming. All right. Thank you so much, Travis. Uh, where can we learn more about Flow? Yes, yeah, so the best place is uh, to go to flow.com, which is our website. And you can also download the Flow app um, for free on Apple and also on the Google App Store. What's kind of cool about that is it's free. So you can actually download it and take a look at where the stations are and, and sign up with no cost and kind of get, get a sense of what it's like to actually be an EV driver and charger. Travis Allen, thanks so much for your time. Good luck with your expansion plans this year. Very exciting. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mark. Well, I hope you enjoyed this weekend's new Tech It Out program. We spoke with Flo about their EV charging stations, Tim Beharin about Apple in 2020, and At Games about the Legends Ultimate Arcade Cabinet for the Home. Tech It Out is powered by Asus, creating technology for today and tomorrow's smart life. Visit asus.com slash us slash radio for more info. That's asus.com forward slash us forward slash radio. Speaking of radio, I'm recording this show right now on an Asus ZenBook Flip S, which is one of their sleekest, thinnest laptops. Really cool stuff. Have a great rest of your weekend, everyone. I appreciate you tuning in. Feel free to leave a review if you're listening to the podcast version and drop me a line if you ever have tech questions at tech at marksaltzman.com. That's M-A-R-C-S-A-L-T-Z-M-A-N.com. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.